Television White Spaces by Tim Warren, Theodore Moore, and Shrabani Das. Sponsored by Professor Maria Jeleva of the University at Albany. Rural communities have long been underserved by internet providers. Owing to the unique costs, estimated at over 7,000 per user in some remote regions, and difficulties of providing service to these areas, many providers have been reluctant to invest in wired infrastructure for these regions without a clear path to recoup their investments. As a result, the digital divide between urban and rural areas has continued to widen. A 2017 New York initiative aimed at providing high-speed access to all residents has led to new, novel approaches being deployed for these hard-to-serve regions. One such approach utilizes unused television white spaces, the uninhabited spectrum between utilized TV station frequencies as a wireless backend for these users. This technology remains new, and the performance has not been well studied in real-world situations, which leads us to ask, how will the network perform in poor weather? Does temperature affect the performance? How about ice accumulation, snow, rain, and humidity? Will interference from nearby TV stations affect it? Our interest in these networks and the factors that might affect them takes us to Thurman, New York. A white space network consisting of six base stations has been deployed there and data has been collected since late 2016. The network consists of three individual base stations with 180 degree directional coverage and a tri-directional setup of three additional antennas, directed away from each other to cover a 360 degree area. Which leads us to another question. Does the intensity of outgoing broadcast from the other two adjacent antennas cause receiving interference for any one of those three antennas? Each of these questions will be addressed in turn, but first, we will jump into the data we are working with. The data from the Thurman stations comes in the form of logs consisting of six metrics. Total byte throughput, signal to noise ratio, and total bad bytes. Each of those recorded for both uplink and downlink. The difficulty with our data is threefold. The collection intervals are asynchronous and not of standardized duration, and the network is prone to resets. This means that trying to pair good bytes and bad bytes is a difficult process. For example, you might have good bytes update at minute 0 and 3, while bad bytes update at minute 1 and 5, with a system reset somewhere before the last update. When the network resets, the exact moment is not logged, and collection only begins from the point of reset, meaning that some of the data in the interval is not recorded. To transform the data into a usable form, Tim processes CSV files using several Bash, Awk, and Python scripts to prorate the cumulative measures into 10-minute buckets and drop the data from any interval wherein a network reset occurred. One of the theories that we wish to test is whether or not distance affects byte error rate. The network itself is rated up to 10 kilometers, and the furthest client from our base station was only 2 kilometers away. So we did not expect to see any extreme results, but thought some quality deterioration was worth investigating. To test the effect, we gathered GPS data, mapped and measured each client and their base stations, and measured byte error rate average and standard deviation correlated against the distance. This map shows the clients grouped by color with the tri-directional station in white in the center, and the other base stations slightly darker in color than their clients. The numbers represent their uplink and downlink byte error rate, respectively. Surprisingly, we found a slight negative correlation between distance and error rate. These other graphs show a scatter plot for distance and byte error rate. You can see that several clients performed much worse than others. However, it seems likely that factors besides distance were the cause of this poor performance. Many clients, located very similarly geographically, had wildly varying performance from their neighbors. Even controlling for the poor performing clients, no clear correlation between distance and performance was noted. One potential problem that could arise is interference with the TV stations and the base station. If the base stations are too close in frequency to the TV station, the way that we want to show if there was any impact was by displaying a box plot that has the TV white space station mapped out against the byte error rate and separated into groups based out far they are away in megahertz to the nearest TV station. And this was done for the uplink and the downlink. In the graph below, we display the uplink byte error rate versus the distance of frequency. As you can see, the ones furthest away actually ended up being having the largest byte error rate 
extra quartile range. This was a surprising result, and one that ends up continuing into the downlink graph as shown below, with the others having much more no nominal uh, inter uh, binary rate in interquartile ranges. However, know that the only base station that has a binary rate that is a distance of 30 away is Garnet Lass. So, I decided to plot the individual base station's binary rates. As shown below, the largest interquartile quartile range exists in two block spots other than Garnet West, for uplink 101 and 103. And since they are both 6 and 12 MHz away respectively, they seem to contribute to the high interquartile range of the previous box plot. For the downlink, however, it was shown that 106 was the highest, but overall they were close to zero, and so this result will seen as very minimal having very minimal impact. One consideration was how weather would affect the network. Being a network that relies on existing uninsulated from the elements, potentially rain, humidity, or even temperature could impact the performance of the signal. Secondary data containing these measures for the area was collected and formatted to match the 10 minute byte error rate buckets, and the correlation between factors was tested by Tim. Surprisingly, no correlation was found for temperature, humidity, snow, or rain. One specific concern with the network was whether or not ice accumulation would impair the network's performance. Our data set did not include ice accumulation, so we inferred it from periods of freezing rain with temperatures below freezing, and measured from that moment until the next time above freezing versus all other periods. These graphs show the periods of ice accumulation in orange and other periods in blue. Note that the gap in the middle is a hole in our data collection. Like the other weather factors, the correlation coefficient was nearly zero for ice accumulation and byte error rate. Overall, it would appear that weather is not a significant factor in the network's performance. Ted also performed a multi-factor analysis on all the variables we've looked at. One other way we wanted to measure the network's performance was by looking at some multi-factor analysis of the data. In order to do this, we took the data sets for distance, TV frequency, and, mer and weather, and merged them together in order to perform a multi-factor analysis, and more specifically a linear regression with, with the byte error rate of uplink and downlink. I split this into three different data sets to analyze, one which includes just the weather data, and one that includes all the data, and another that includes the frequency distance data, but no weather data. Then I performed a linear regression on all three of these data sets. For the weather data, we found our coefficient of determination to be about 0 0.008 for the uplink and downlink, showing that the weather data seems to have a very weak linear relationship with the byte error rate alone. Then for the second set, we did the same and found the coefficient of determination for the uplink to be 0 0.039 and for the downlink to be 0 0.0005, showing a very weak linear relationship between the frequency data, distance data, and the byte error rate data. Then for the combined error rate, we found the coefficient of determination to be 0 0.027 and 0 0.0086 respectively. These extremely low coefficients of determination show us that our fits do not perform very well on our data set, and it means that this likely it performs independently of, of the factors or in some other relationship that we have not explored. One particular interest is the tri-directional antenna. This space station actually consists of three different antenna situated in different directions. You can see on the map the yellow dots are one antenna, the orange dots are the client serviced by another antenna, and the red a third. The yellow and orange are back to back while the red is pointed off to the side. The thought here is that when the two other antennas have strong outgoing broadcast that could potentially cause backsplash and interfere with the broadcast 
of any other antenna. To test this, we aggregated all the user data by base station and plotted the total output versus the byte error rate of the other antenna. Seen here is Shrobny's graph for station 101, which is the station facing to the northwest. Here she plotted the byte error rate of all the users on that station against the total output data, the downlink from the other two antenna. She drew a regression line and you can see it sloping down slightly. This shows that there was not a strong correlation. She also split the data into bins based on the amount of data the other two antenna were outputting and drew box plots and calculated the mean and standard deviation for those as well. She repeated this for station 102. You can see similar results for both 102, which is the antenna facing to the southwest, as well as 103, the antenna facing to the southeast. In conclusion, it seems like the network fares very well and is actually quite robust against crosstalk, the interference from the tridirectional antenna on top of each other. Throughout our analysis, the network has shown itself to be well-designed and incredibly resilient from most negative effects of the environment. None of the variables that we studied had a significant effect on performance, although there is room for more analysis. Individual clients vary drastically in terms of average performance, and future inquiries should investigate whether terrain plays a larger role. This technology is known to be deployable in mountainous areas like the Adirondacks, but that doesn't mean that it is unaffected. To wit, several poorly performing clients were confirmed to have trees directly between the user's antenna and the base station. We don't have full documentation of obstructions between cl clients and antenna, but that would be a good next step to take. We also would like to perform all analyses individually on each client to make sure that individual factors were not lost in the aggregate measures. Overall, however, we believe that the network appears to fare very well overall, even in challenging conditions. Hopefully, this will encourage wider adoption in communities that could be benefited by this technology. All stock video and pictures used were from Pexels.com, free use pictures and video. And all audio was from Bensound.com, free use music for your videos.